guys so I'm just going to follow up on to uh, one of the recent videos I've done uh, about one of the purchases I've made recently uh, this but this uh, video is going to be the first of um, many I should hope of the essential histories uh, Osprey publishing textbooks um, that are a collection I've started um, well I, I say started I've actually started it a lot a long time ago uh, back in the university days some 10 years ago when they were being published and um, I've just continued ever since with a bit of a view to hopefully teaching history in the future um, uh, or at least you know trying to give myself a bit of a collection to uh, to take it to take all in um, this one is going to be about the French religious wars uh, 1562 to 1598 so this one is written by Robert J. Knecht. Um, he is uh, the preeminent, pre sorry, preeminent historian uh, of this particular um, topic. The books, all of the books, are just under a hundred pages. Normally about ninety-six pages. The the type of stuff that the the books encompass, they have uh, a lot of narrative in this. So you get a chronology of the the events, of the historical events themselves. You get overviews and uh, character information about the main players within the uh, within the the conflict. Uh, you get uh, precursors to the conflict, what led to it, what was the economic uh, state at the time. You get a sort of, you get very much like a state of play of the world and of the region at the time before the conflict, and then afterwards as well. Um, to review uh, afterwards, as well as then you, what I find one of the more the the the, the best sort of um, uh, pieces of information in these books to take away from is actually the bibliography and the references that are used in order to put all of this together. So um, you can draw upon lots of different ideas as well. Then, particularly if there's a bit of a confront as a, a controversial topic or a topic with competing sort of ideo ideological um, versions of history on there. Um, for instance, like the American Civil War um, or World War One, World War Two, then. Then you very very much you can look at the uh, sources being used there, compare and contrast them with ones you've seen yourself. Anyways, so I'll go into this, uh, and I'll probably have to after read a little bit because uh, I have to make some notes on this one and condense it down a little bit for you. I'm not going to read all 96 pages for you. I'll probably just do uh, a couple of pages that I've written down. So, what was this uh, conflict about then? So, uh, French religious wars, like I said, the on the date uh, 1562 to 1598. Um, on the f on the sort of the cover of it, it is a Catholic versus Protestant, hu uh, as they were called, Huguenot uh, wars. Protestant being more of a looser term, um, the Protestant being very much a broad church of competing sort of fringe ideologies and dissenters from the Catholic orthodoxy at the time. So within the Protestant realm, you have Calvinists, you have Lutherans, you have uh, Christian humanists you have a lot of sort of uh, diff you know uh, offshoots of that as well um, who sort of threw their lot in with the uh, Huguenots but not only that you have actual Catholics as well who would uh, throw their lot in with the Huguenots the reason being so is that as well as being a bit of a religious uh, war this it, it, this in, in itself as well was very much an aristocratic uh, civil war and a war uh, against central control um, that was being sort of consolidated by the uh, the French monarch at the time. Um, so you've had a sort of a build up of those uh, ebbs and ebbs and ebbs of um, central control of the French king trying to sort of wrestle in and become. Uh, an absolute ruler as you would see in say the Tsar of Russia or other kings across uh, uh, across Christendom at the time but the sort of the idea of a, of a single monarch ruling government all by themselves without any you know to all corners of the of the nation and and, uh, and of the of of the people of the country it was pretty much unheard of, particularly of France. I mean, France is not the France that we know today. Um, the borders there was no real official borders of France at the time. I mean, just to give an idea, I mean, you've got 
little enclaves within France at the time. You've got the, the southern border of the Pyrenees was pushed a little bit further north. You've got the kingdoms of Navarre lower down there, uh, which will come later on to play very significantly in this. You have an enclave, a little enclave within Avignon in France, which is a... Um, at the time you had competing popes so you had at one point you had two at least two different popes one either in Milan or in Rome and the other one in Avignon and very much these competing popes were they called each other illegitimate um, they were pretty much political puppets of whichever competing part of Christendom uh, best suited their aims at the time um, and uh, so that's what you had in, in France in the north you had um, you still had an awful lot of um, Habsburg uh, Habsburg um, lands to the north uh, what, what, what was called at the time the Spanish Netherlands so as in the name suggests it would be today's Netherlands or Holland uh, as well as um, Belgium uh, on, the, on the border too uh, you have a lot of sort of uh, city states and German states pushing the, the, the sort of those uh, eastern borders of France a little bit further across the Rhine as well, um, as well as uh, the Kingdom of Savoy uh, on the French uh, yes eastern border as well. Then um, pretty much near the Italian northern states as well. Then so no official borders, no national legal system per se so no sort of like ultimate code of national legal system you had different jurisdictions you had different levels of of who would apply justice as well um you had uh no sort of like later on you would see the code napoleon come in and it would be a civil code across all, all conquered areas of the napoleonic empire as well as uh the um, uh, french empire as well um, there was no official language as such, as such so the kingdom of france had lots of different languages you had in the north you have what well, you know what was called at the time middle french so very much like shakespearean english middle english you have middle french a version of uh, derivative today's language is, is a derivative of that um a bit more modernized you had at the time as well uh occitan so occitan was a language uh, primarily spoken in the south um, you can still hear some of the differentiation with the uh, French that's being spoken in the south now um, but Occitan lingered a little bit from those uh, you know earlier middle ages up until this time period as well as Breton uh, Breton which is up in the north northwest of um, uh, of France as well there so lots of different languages you had German as well German being spoken on the eastern border some people spoke entirely German even though they were in technically French territory as well Italian um, as well so lots of different languages in France the nobility were pretty much autonomous so whereas there wasn't any sort of uh, sort of bureaucratic machine yet uh, take uh, bureaucratic state machinery in which um, the nobility could bury themselves into to make themselves, you know, to solidify their position within the social hierarchy. They themselves ruled over their own sort of little fiefdoms and areas, castles, landed landed areas, and gentry as well. So they were very much autonomous, left to apply, like I said, apply justice under their own means, within reason and with a with a certain little degree of of consistency, um, but pretty much autonomous i mean not autonomous to wage war entirely as uh from a foreign policy point of view on their own but internally very much they were able to sort of uh, chafe against each other as well um very 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 little central authority for the french king at the time um tax revenue was one thing in which uh they were able to do but would have to either call the estate general which is kind of like calling parliament back in the day in order to uh, satisfy any uh, shortcomings of the tax situation um, overall though I mean France at the time was in a pretty decent spot at this time uh, France was one of the most populous nations 
uh, in Western Europe at the time. 16 million people, which is quite a lot. Um, they hadn't really had a bad harvest uh, for around, well, well over 100, 100 years, 120 years. So no real crippling harvest, very agricultural based um, country uh, at the time as well. Um, there was a, a 60 year economic boom from 1460 to uh, uh, from 1460 sorry to 1520 um, there was uh, they were very very self-sufficient in pretty much everything uh, in terms of the base material uh, to sustain the nation but in terms of reforming um, the machinery and so and reforming the the levers of production and reforming society in order to make it more efficient um that just wasn't happening the, the sheer abundance meant that the the notion of reform wasn't really necessary um so if albeit being one of the major players in europe and one of the more populous and produ productive places in europe it wasn't necessarily the most advanced um there was a uh, in terms of defending the kingdom there was very much delegated authority to the provincial um defense uh, defenses in terms of the gendarmerie and the governors of certain areas they could come from the nobility too um so you would have people then raise uh, companies of gendarmes and they would then patrol and they would uh the reason for this is is that in order to keep uh, people in the field and to keep a policing a policing presence across the kingdom was very very expensive so it was left down to local people to raise their own defense to raise their own policing activities rather than rely on central authority uh, the king's uh, wealth to do that as really there wasn't any benefit to it if 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 the if the, if, the, if if there was you know provincial strife in Lorraine say for instance that's up to people of Lorraine rather than the the king in Paris uh, to do anything about that anyway so that's settled so that's where we we find France at the time we find France a little bit misshapen in terms of its actual nation na you know nation state body but very very prosperous very uh, populous strong militarily uh, uh, D uh, how can I put it they, they were um very much not not deregulated, but they were very much decentralized um, in terms of uh, their their nation as well. But that would later come in to to, to hamper them. So we had sporadic pro Protestant clashes post fifteen nineteen. So you have the Protestant Reformation, fourteen hundreds fifteen hundreds. You have the spread of these ideas, um, uh, you know, alternatives to the Orthodox Catholic teachings of the time. Uh, you have um, sort of an appeal for the Lutheran and Christian humanist spread to France. Um, so they spread eastwards and very, very much go down to the south, um, where you find what's called then the Huguenot Crescent in the south of France. Then, so for, from La Rochelle in this area here of western France all the way down then to or I should say I should say where, where am I going all the way down <laughs> that way to uh, places like Toulouse, Toulon uh, all the way down to Avignon and the, and these areas too so as I, as I mentioned one of the um, one of the main exporters of this new sort of uh, Protestant ideology uh, and the sort of rebellion, rebellion against central authority, whether that's religious or political, was John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin was uh, uh, one of these re religious refugees uh, who fled to Switzerland, and he ended up then, you know, proselytizing a lot of people to his to his uh, his, his religious uh, way. And then those missionaries then were being sent into France, in order to sort of uh, lead the lead give the give the word this new word of God to the people, this new version of uh, Christianity uh, to them. So the the where the things started to turn with these religious wars, the, the lower nobility were the first to turn. Uh, the lower clergy also went with them as well. As well as people who lived in urban centres, so you're talking people like artisans. You're talking people who made luxury goods, 
not so much the peasants or people who were uh, serfs and tied to the land themselves it was more people who lived in urban areas um, who were the first to turn as well as nobility and clergy why the high nobility and clergy didn't immediately turn was because they were the main beneficiaries of the system in which they were now being asked to turn against so effectively their loyalty was to their current situation rather than the prospect of better situations shall we say um, it was really unclear why some turned and why some didn't historians still have not nailed that to the wall yet about why some people did turn and why some people did not that's still a mystery we can guess we can surmise reasons why but ultimately there is no there was no flashpoint there was no um there, you know, there was there was no compelling evidence there was nothing like that which really you know it is more so more so a gradual you know more so of a graduated um opinion that one arrived at rather than say a flashpoint took over somebody and then they 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 rallied around around the um Huguenot cause cause so next on then local autonomy and the lack of central authority meant that Protestants Protestantism spread faster in this Huguenot crescent so roughly around 2 million people around 10% of the French population of the time were classed as Huguenot Protestant Calvinist Lutheran humanist whatever non-orthodox Catholic um, or the, or part of the Catholic orthodoxy is what we can say so coming forward then to uh, 1534 the monarchy adopts a, uh, a persecution um, policy against the Huguenots and against the Protestants and you have in 1559 the sh the peace of Chateau Cambrésis so France at the time was embroiled in Italy and in the Italian wars and trying to expand French influence in that area and really to try and combat the rising power of the Habsburg monarchy in Central Europe um, the peace of Chateau Cambrésis settled that for the time being France really needed and the French monarchy and nobility really needed to get a grip of these religious wars and this religious strife that was going on within the kingdom and with the sort of with the persecution policy as well it left them now freed up in order to pretty much crush or at least firmly deal with this uh, religious insurrection within its own kingdom so the it allowed the king so so the king at the time was Henry the second and unfortunately Henry died leaving his brother Francis the second to ascend to the throne but the Huguenots argued against Francis becoming king they believed that there was a much better claimant to the throne of France um, and the Prince de Condé was the person that the Huguenot uh, faction in France have put forward for the throne now the there was also you had another claimant which was uh, the king of Navarre they were the Bourbon family the kings of Navarre um, and they were they were also co they were also equal claimants as well as the, the Condé family uh, to the throne of France so what happens next is effectively something you see out of Game of Thrones which is fucking crazy is effectively there's there is a lower nobility faction a brother a, a set of brothers called the Guise family now the Guise family are uh, from the provincial Lorraine area of France very much not uh, Paris centric very much not traditional French nobility albeit they are uh, noblesse but they effectively seize royal control uh, and they use Francis II as a effective puppet king uh, they use influence 
in court to subdue uh, the, the, the king's mother and to convince the king that the, what they are doing their way is the is the right course of action so they've effectively had a coup and they are using Francis II in order to make prop up their uh, their sort of noble takeover of this uh, of this uh, monarchy and they've promoted the persecution policy so they are going after the Huguenots big time the Huguenots are pissed off because they are thinking hang on a minute we've got two people here the King of Navarre the Bourbon and de Conde are better claimants to the throne of France or at least equal to Francis II effectively the Guise people were the first to strike and they've got him first and what we have then is the kick off of these religious wars so like I say the Guise brothers seize royal control and persecute further Francis then dies and is succeeded by the ten year old child king Charles the Ninth, and the mum the mother of the of the king regent is Catherine de Medici uh, Medici's being uh, unbelievably wealthy and influential political family originating from Florence and in Italy uh, for centuries probably the wealthiest family in the world at that time um, now primarily uh, there's a Protestant military build up I should say so the Protestants now are thinking right okay so we're up against it. We've been beaten. We've been beaten to the pump. It's time to actually go to war now. There's enough grounds for us to launch a um, a war against this uh, subverted uh, mo um, monarchy in France. What happens is then is Medici, Catherine de Medici, wanted to avoid any bloodshed, so she she frees religious prisoners, and where is this sort of uh, clemency and an act of mercy was very very commendable at the time of religious fanaticism and the pretty much collapse of central control within France at the time the this the, the freeing of these religious prisoners actually ends up leading to attacks on Catholic churches uh, and Catholic Catholic worship um, there is a massive backlash then from uh, French Catholics who they then go on to uh, start having internal domestic strife with the Huguenots wherever they find them in France so it's very very similar to the ethnic wars in uh, the former Yugoslavia in the 90s not only political but then you got a religious aspect to it as well what happens then is there is a massacre at Wasi in 1862 which really kicks it all off uh, the Guise um, family massacre a bunch of Huguenots in a barn worshipping and that then is a trigger point for the Huguenots to kick off the war against central powers central French power so just to give a bit of context around the, the two sides so the Royalists always had a stronger uh, they were able to draw upon more men, more arms, um, they, but the only thing that they did lack was a cohesive or united uh, army at any one time. Not only did the royalists have to contend with an internal struggle, but they also had to, you know, countenance a foreign invasion as well. Um, so primarily, they drew a lot of their manpower was drawn away in order to maintain the, the French borders. Um, uh, as well as combat this internal strife going on at the moment so the Huguenots also had a massive advantage of, of using a lot of mercenary soldiers coming into France at the time so you had German raiders um, mounted horsemen who were fantastic soldiers writers uh, were, so these Germans were mercenaries paid either in gold or bounty or booty and bounty or whatever they call it um, but the only problem is with these mercenaries is that if they were not paid and there was very little campaigning season wherever you've employed them they will just pillage the land wherever you are they had no loyalty whatsoever to their employer uh, whatsoever uh, another group that they employed uh, a very distinguished uh, military force was the Lansknechts uh, 
so these pike soldiers were very very advanced and were used pretty much by primarily by the swiss pike as swiss pikemen and in central europe in the german city states as well um they were fantastic soldiers and they came to the fore really in the italian wars uh, uh and also the uh, the swiss uh, the swiss wars as well um so france and the huguenots drew upon these uh distinguished battle hardened and what you could say was ideologically aligned soldiers to them too so they had a huge advantage by you know made up for their lack of numbers with quality soldiery like I said before, maintaining the army was really tough and expensive. Um, campaigning season back in this time was very, very small window of opportunity. And when people weren't on campaign, um, the units, uh, military units, were disbanded. So you could be far from from home one day, and then you could be without any pay for three months. So you'd have to find something to do, either go into local employment or a lot of banditry happened. Um, so you have a lot of uh, criminality going on within France at the time, uh, which was decimating the local civilian population as well, nor only just the war itself. Uh, so there was no official standing army of France at the time, like I said. So because of that reason, there was no official standing army. Um, the armies would be dispersed for winter because of the lack of fu uh, or because of the lack of funds, as I previously mentioned. So. When the war kicks off in 1862, the Huguenots, with the uh, being the most aggrieved faction, you could say, uh, after the Guises, the Guise brothers take control of the French monarchy, that the Huguenots make some fantastic surprise gains. They really sort of come out of the blocks, punching, to use, to use a boxing analogy. They just come out swinging. Um, they start taking town after town after town uh, before they are actually met in the field and challenged uh, proper. But the Royalists do end up beating them back. The sheer numbers and manoeuvrability of the Royalists then do come to play. Uh, there are gains by the uh, the Huguenots, but I think when the when the first shots are fired, it is effectively the kickoff of the, of the religious wars, and it does show the uh, central authority in France that no, these people do mean fucking business. They are not just talking a good game, threatening. Uh, civil war they are going for it and they're going to go f to make sure that their religious uh, or dynastic struggle comes out on top so we have uh, the royalists beating them back the Huguenot then do something very very interesting the Huguenot then actually reach out to the English Queen at the time Queen Elizabeth I and offer Queen Elizabeth um, uh, an opportunity to come back into France, where the English royal, uh, the English royal crown had diminished significantly after the Hundred Years' War, um, where the only English sort of territory left in France was Calais, um, and uh, and Dunkirk. Now, in this struggle, Elizabeth wanted to ex re re you know pretty much retake some of that Normandy land, which the French king, so the English kings have uh, historically held in the past and um, unfortunately there was a battle at Drieux um, between the Huguenot and the Royalist factions a significant victory for the Royalists in this case albeit was not a knockout blow though so both and it's a strange one where you see both commanders of both armies actually get taken hostage and prisoner um, so I don't I can't recall another battle where that's actually happened I've seen battles where both commanders die but not when they both get kidnapped <laughs> so uh, fortunately on both sides there were uh, competent captains and able to make sure that the battle reached its full conclusion but uh, the 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 fighters so de Conde was the Huguenot um, general and Montmercy was the royalist general both taken prisoner they then you then after this major sort of flashpoint battle at Drieu have multiple pieces and settlements that go through conflict um, and little flashpoints kick off the wars here there again and everywhere maybe for a couple of months before yet another peace uh, settlement and negotiation again between um, Catholic and Protestant and definitely it seems that 
every single time there was a peace settlement and not the the sometimes it would sway one way where the royalists would not give an inch and then it would go the other way where the protestants and the huguenots would make some significant gains but every time they kept chipping away the huguenots for more religious freedom being allowed in france so we get to a point in 1572 where there's what's called the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. The Huguenot had attacked, uh, were attacked all over Paris and major towns with the approval of the Royalists. Uh, so effectively the, the Guise family with uh, Catherine de' Medici had sanctioned the clandestine uh, plans to massacre as many Huguenots as possible. The Huguenot leader at the time, the colony, is killed and assassinated as well. Um, we then see, we, we, what we do see then later on is the dynastic struggle really reaches boiling point and effectively these religious wars take on the dynastic struggle more so than the religious aspect you have the new leader of the protestant movement after colony's death you have henry of navarre so henry of navarre he is the king of that nation um he takes up the huguenot cause he is by by right at this time pretty much the best claimant to the french throne uh but with the Catholic faction desperately not wanting to have a Protestant on the throne, they are doing everything they can to try and stop him from ascending to the French throne by force or by negotiation um, or by right. So what we have is a series of military conflicts which position Henry to approach the other side where the Catholic League are not so much defeated but are sort of ground into a stalemate to a point where there is no winning for either side in, in, in a in a bit of a knockout blow there's no there's not going to be any significant victory so henry decides to convert in brackets convert to, to catholicism in order then to to seem more palatable to the uh, the French royal court at the time, and to the people, his enemies, as he's been fighting for de for a good number of years, who he hopes to bring back into the fold with him as the king, and them acting as a as a loyal, um, a, a loyal nobility. So uh, later on, Henry does do that. You have uh, just to touch on though, you have sporadic war overall. So overall, you have eight different campaigns over this period from 62 to 98 eight different military campaigns like i said kicked off and then resolved with a lot of peace settlements and religious uh, settlements so you have what's what's called the battle of kutra in 1587 and this really sets the stall now for henry of navarre really to take the take the reins of of the um to become to be French king, he defeated the royals in battle at Coutras in 1587. Outnumbered, always outnumbered, always uh, all, but a fantastic general nonetheless, and outskilled his opponents on many occasions. Don't get me wrong; he had to retreat sometimes and maybe lost the odd engagement here or there. But Henry of Navarre, Henry the Fourth of France, as he would later become was very much a uh, he won the big ones as they say he, he, he won the big moments so uh, King Henry the uh, third who is the King Henry at the time uh, wanted to be free of the Catholic League control and the and the Guise brothers who had been controlling being really the power behind the throne for a long long time and really had instigated and tried to you know and fan the flames of this conflict for a long long time so in a really Game of Thrones style uh, turn of events the, the two Guise brothers are murdered and the, and the Catholic League's preferred king is Cardinal Bourbon who is a Catholic uh, relative of Henry of Navarre um, 
who the Catholics want to try and put on the throne instead of Henry he is then arrested as well so pretty much all obstacles to the um, Henry becoming king are almost complete bar one which is Henry the third so Henry the third surprisingly is assassinated after cleaning house himself he is then assassinated himself uh, and that leaves the path wide open a open goal uh, for Henry of Navarre to become Henry the fourth king of all of France and at the battle of Arcou against the Catholic League general Maillard uh, he is victorious there were there was a continued Catholic League um, uh, continued Catholic League fighting against this against Navarre even after Navarre had pretty much said that he is King of France and these people in people in who would previously opposed him and the Huguenot had, uh, and the Huguenot Protestants had started now to come over to his side so we get into the sort of the conclusion here of this conflict where the Protestant Huguenot uh, commander is effectively manoeuvred successfully through these sporadic religious wars and religious pieces and, and settlements to become and he's actually come out on top of the dynastic struggle too so his family the Bourbon family would henceforth be the, the, the royal family of France and after victory Henry the fourth uh, sorry after the victory at Arcu Henry the fourth then conquers Paris um, Paris opens its gates to him and he is the officially pretty much ended the religious wars they do end though um, as a full conclusion in 1598 at the Edict of Nantes so whilst the Edict of Nantes does not guarantee French religious uh, freedom for the Huguenot it is the best that they could have hoped for with such a dominant Catholic uh, and Pope uh, and uh, uh, sorry, dominant Catholic and overwhelming um, noble uh, opposition to the Huguenot Protestant um, faction. Um, they'd got their own as king now. Uh, so Henry of Navarre, albeit uh, had uh, converted in brackets to Catholicism, still apparently through his life was very much uh, a Protestant until death. Uh, his lineage lived on until uh, the French Revolution, but unfortunately, the the peace, the religious peace, did not last until seventeen. I think it was the seventeen hundreds when when Louis the Fourteenth repealed the Edict of Nantes. Um, but that culminates the French religious wars. So, just to give you a conclusion, the French religious wars. What were they? in the title they were religious wars but also a dynastic struggle lots of sporadic wars eight in total from 1562 to 1598 lots of changing sides am amazing 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 storylines lots of innovations of warfare as well lots of very interesting pieces of information and a transition from the old medieval way of doing things such as mercenaries and non-nation states transforming into the more modern era of a centralised authority absolute monarch under Henry IV king, uh, previous King of Navarre Henry IV of France now um, more of a more of a more of a sort of uh, royal say in terms of uh, autonomy but then also in terms of what happened then after this was that France became as the as it, as France emerged from civil war it, it retook its place in Europe as one of the more dominant nations there both militarily socio-economically and culturally as well so overall this was a bit of a, a blip in the development of the French nation you could say but a necessary one where religion and dynastic struggles were intertwined in order to give us this conflict I think it's incredibly interesting and some of the sort of like I said Game of Thrones-esque moments in this were absolutely 
uh, unbelievable really um, and goes to show really that the the court politics was very very uh, cutthroat at the time safe to say um, but yeah a very interesting piece of history this is the f like I say the first uh, textbook that I've looked at uh, that I've reviewed sorry I've looked at many many more but the first one I've reviewed proper from the Osprey Publishing series of Essential Histories. Um, again, just to recap, this one is number uh, number forty-seven. You can see that. Okay, yeah, number forty-seven. There we are. So um, I'll be doing a few more later on. But yeah, let me know what you thought of this. If you can recommend any other books, I'd much appreciate it. Um, this book is on Amazon. If you wanted to pick this one up. It is not very cheap, but it is well worth it. You can either get a Kindle version for eight thirty-two. I did manage to pick up this a, a used copy for around six pounds as well. So five eighty-three isn't too bad actually. So this is quite a um, enjoy. This is quite an enjoyable book. I really did like picking up something new that I've never experienced before in terms of a historical blind spot. So yeah. Um, let me know what you thought of it and uh, if you've got any more recommendations I'd love to hear it but please give me a like and uh, subscribe to the channel uh, there'll be a lot more of these um, historical um, textbook reviews coming up shortly